right, well, if you have your Bible still out, open, turned on, we are going to be in Luke chapter 1 this morning. Luke chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 46 through 55. And so as you make your way through the uh, New Testament, I want to remind you that this is indeed the third Sunday in Advent. And so the agenda and focus today is to reflect on Mary's song or praise or her holy magnificat and how it shows us the reason for the season. Why that we're going to come in here next Sunday and then the 12 days that follow and celebrate the birth of Christ. And so uh, please make your way there. We're going to reference it throughout the sermon, but we're going to get ahead and uh, go ahead and read it. And so if you're able, I would ask you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And this is the word of God for the people of God, and we respond with thanks be to God. Amen, friends. You may be seated. Well, it is so good uh, to be back in worship with you all here at TMC. I know for some of you, I feel like a stranger. If you can believe it, the last time I was in these pulpits was way back on November 5th, 42 days ago. And on that day, uh, you and I had just wrapped up our trunk or treat. We had just celebrated All Saints Sunday. We were getting ready from our Gifts of God Giving pan campaign, and we finished our fall sermon series on First Thessalonians, and we were looking forward to to Thanksgiving week, all those 42 days ago, and then we blinked, and here you and I are today, three full weeks into the Advent season, if you can believe it. And what that means is that next Sunday is not only the fourth Sunday in Advent, but this year in the liturgical calendar, next Sunday is also Christmas Eve. And as someone whose favorite time of the year is this time of the year, if I confess, I kind of get a little sad around the middle of December, because I know that all the exciting pageantry and festivity and hustle and bustle that comes with the Advent and Christmas season is just a couple of weeks away from ending. It's normally around this Sunday, Joy Sunday and Advent, that I don't really feel joyful because I know that the warmth and the beauty of the season is about to pass from me. And for Pastor Sarah and I, like I know for many of you, uh, this time of year is extra. And it can be exhausting because for us, it involves extra travels and parties and increased workload from a church perspective, putting up the decorations, taking down the decorations, chasing the decorations across the neighborhood when it blows away. I don't know if you've had that fun experience. That was me in the rain. Um, the shopping, the visiting with family, whether you love them or hate them. And then for many years for us, this time of year involved all of that and also graduate school final exams. And thank God. Those are in the rearview mirror. But each year in the thick of just trying to stay afloat amid the extra waves of the things to do and the places to go in December, I feel like so much of this season easily passes by us like an unforeseen ship on a moonless night in the fog that we don't even see. Because on November 24th, the night when Thanksgiving's done, it just feels like we go to sleep and then we wake up on January 2nd and where the heck did Christmas and Advent go? And then come January 2nd, life seems to shift down to normal speed and regular reality sets in. And we begin to do the daily grind once again like we did in November. The pageantry, the festivity, the hustle and the bustle of this season fades into the past with another year in the books. And you see, unfortunately, what was Advent and what was Christmas for us is lost and forgotten, along with the frenzy that is this month. You see, we sleepwalk into Epiphany, 
through January, and then we trudge into Lent in February with no afterthought of what was or what should have been of the precious Advent and Christmas seasons. And as I've gotten older and the longer that I've kept my faith on Jesus and walked with him as a disciple, I've recognized a deeper and more persistent preoccupation of him in all that I do. And it's for that reason that, that I think increasingly each year I'm more aware and fearful of missing out on enjoying the fullness of this season due to the domination of the busyness and the greater demands of this time of year. And I hope it's starting to become clear that I'm not just talking about all the secular commercialization of Christmas, the lights, the presents, the pageantry, but I'm also talking about the spiritual nature of these two holy seasons, Advent and Christmas, and the beautiful means of grace that is present, evident, and made available by both of them for our edification. And you see, if the church could ever still itself from the trappings and the commercialization of Christmas and slow ourselves down during these four weeks and during the 12 days of Christmas and reflect on the things of God instead of the hubbub of the season, I'm convinced that we would see the truly rich presentation of what God has done for the world, for you and for me who believe on him by an unfathomable display of his power, love, and grace as they came to us as one of us to overcome for us. You see, when we blink and travel our way through December because we don't force ourselves to slow down and to steep in the meaning behind these seasons, church, we forfeit a tremendous opportunity to glory God and to nourish our souls in the busiest time of the year. Yet the secularization of this holiday has redefined Christmas for most Christians and for most churches in an idolatrous manner. And tragically, it has all but annihilated the meaning and the season of Advent itself that is to prepare us for the 12 days of Christmas. Many don't know or easily forget that the actual 12 days of Christmas start the day after Christmas Eve. So for most of December, the church's focus should be on Advent, not on Christmas, as the way to prepare our hearts and minds for Christmas. It's during this time of year where our worship and our discipleship should be ordered around anticipating the coming of Christ, both his first and his second comings, so that we can rightly celebrate his arrival on the day of his birth. You see, these four Sundays before Christmas, for you and I are in the thick of, are meant to center our focus on remembering or discovering our desperate need to be saved. That's how Advent prepares us for the birth of Jesus. So that when Jesus comes on Christmas, we worship and we celebrate the arrival of the Savior that we've been desperately longing for, for four straight weeks. And you see, what's beautiful is that these weeks before we celebrate the birth of Jesus are for us to rediscover and to sit in the reality that we actually all harbor a longing and a need to be saved by something greater than ourselves. And that looks different for each and every one of you. But as those 2,000 years to the right of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, our resurfaced and rediscovered longing for a Savior should never leave us in lament during this season, but always leave us in praise because we know the end of the story. It should lead us to worship and lead us in greater affection of God because we know a Savior did come we know he will return as we have longingly and desperately needed him to do so and wait for him to do so to consummate the kingdom that is already but not quite fully yet. And so the very things of God that our souls capture and are captivated by during the, the brief passing moments of Christmas, whether it's a Christmas Eve service, whether it's 30 minutes in a cantata, whether it's sporadic in worship throughout the, the four weeks, the things that our souls capture and marvel at with God should be the very things that our souls are totally immersed in and consumed by throughout the entire four weeks, not just in brief moments of passing through some church doors. And unfortunately, the passing glimpse of marveling at God's coming in Jesus too easily dissolves in a manner that leaves us no better than when we stumbled across them 
that one night on Christmas Eve or that one night at a cantata or passing through worship if you can make it. Our other preoccupations and concerns of the Christmas and Advent season ultimately, whether we want to admit it or not, overshadow and take precedent so often over our godly concerns during the Christmas and Advent seasons. And I firmly believe it's for those simple reasons that the Christmas spirit so drastically disappears on December 26th. You see, who we are on January 1st as a church is indicative of really who we were between December 1st and 31st. Stuart Briscoe uh, observes this problem all too well. He says that, you know, there's a problem with the Christmas spirit. Have you ever noticed how it passes? And friends, on December 26th, it's all but evaporated. And he tells a story to illustrate his point. And he tells a story of a, of a conversation that he had with an old German man one time. And this German man fought in World War I for Germany. And so World War I warfare was not high tech. It was down in dirty trench warfare and the blood and mud and vermin. Uh, the trenches were so close together, you knew that the enemy was over there and you could often hear them talking. And this old German soldier was telling the story that on one cold moonlit Christmas Eve, he was huddled in the bottom of his trench trying to keep warm. And all of a sudden, he heard a rich baritone voice tuned in, singing across the way from the British uh, trenches, the Lord is my shepherd. And that beautiful sound of praise carried over in their trenches. And then they heard a sweet tenor voice carry from the German side, singing the same song in German. And he said, for those few moments with the British and the Germans singing the same song of praise in their own language, everybody in the trenches were concentrated on the sound of those two invisible singers and the beautiful harmony. You see, the British soldiers and the German soldiers sang praise to the Lord who is their shepherd. And then he said, the next morning on, Earth, on Christmas, that some of the British soldiers actually climbed out of their trenches and they had a football, which really means a soccer ball, and they started playing a game of soccer. And so the German soldiers came out of their trenches and they wanted to play, and this is during the Christmas truce. And so Germany and England played a game of soccer on Christmas Day and England won. And then he said the next morning when Christmas was over, the carnage began again. Machine guns and bayonet fighting Everything was back to normal. You see, on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, in response to God's shepherding, there was worship, reconciliation, togetherness, and peace and joy. And then a little longer than 24 hours later, there was animosity, war, and division again, death again. As quick as the Christmas spirit brought life for that one day, it just as was quickly forgotten, begetting death instead of life. Now, praise God, you and I are not in the throes of trench warfare. But however, you and I are always in the throes of a battle against conforming to the influence of secular culture versus conforming to the influence of Jesus and his kingdom. And often when the secular influence wins the day, which is through the month of December, the Advent and Christmas spirit is often forgotten and omitted completely altogether. Because you see, when our focus is on the beautiful decorations and lights and parties and presents and get-togethers and travel and achieving the postcard-esque family Christmas, in the words of that great theologian Clark Griswold, our focus undeniably is not worship of God and it's not godly devotion. You see, the reason for the season is Jesus. And when we get caught up in the trappings of the secular holiday, Jesus is replaced with the frills and trappings of our own self-gratification that comes with the purpose of a holiday, not with the purpose of worship and devotion to him. And you see, in this misguided and godly place, which we're all guilty of finding ourselves, me included, we lose the very reason why Jesus is very much the center of the season itself. And as we make Jesus the indirect object in decoration of the holiday season, we don't just forget him, friends. We lose all understanding of him. You see, the Christmas and Advent spirit slips away on us on December 26th because the Christmas candle that we light on Christmas Eve doesn't align with how Christ burns in most of our hearts. For many on Christmas Eve, Christ is nothing more than a flimsy match that is struck for that single occasion 
which is easily blown out or consumed before the night is even over. Yet for others, on Christmas Eve, Christ burns in their heart like a mighty bonfire with no threat of becoming extinguished. For those faithful learners of Jesus, for those disciples, they spent their entire Advent season constructing the kindling of that bonfire, carefully piecing it together with the firewood of worship and prayer and repentance and personal devotion in reflecting seriously on the soul's longing for Jesus to bring them or to sustain them in hope, peace, love, and joy. And for those Christians, the Christmas spirit does not die on Christmas Eve. It continues forward, settling, setting the very tone of the new year in their formation as disciples. But just as importantly for them on Christmas Eve and throughout the Christmas season, Christ is not lost or miscomprehended. He is firmly known, present, and gloried within their lives. And you see, one of the many ways that Advent builds that kindling within our hearts to burn for Jesus is it helps us prepare by rightly celebrating the birth of Jesus. And one of the ways that Advent helps us do that as we come to the Advent scriptures is we come to the Song of Mary because Mary has a message for us in her hymn of praise that beautiful song that's been repeated for millennium in prayers and in chants across the whole church. And you see our sermon text is Mary's direct response to her relative, probably her cousin Elizabeth's, blessing and adoration of Mary coming to visit her. And she blesses and adores her because of her role as the Lord, as God's, as Jesus' mother. And for God's special favor bestowed on her for that role, and for her belief that God's promises concerning the conception, birth, and life of Jesus will come true. Mary responds to that as it sinks in, holy cow, what is God doing for me? And what does that mean for the world? And so the 10 verses that follow in this beautiful hymn details Mary's uplifting praise of God's promises of what he has done for her and what he will do for Israel in sending Jesus. And you see, this whole song is a New Testament version of a psalm. And it borrows language and quotation and allusion from the actual Old Testament Psalter itself. You see, Mary's Old Testament saturated heart and mind took the language from the Psalms to give God praise and worship in the moment of our text. And friends, that, 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 that's a beautiful thing, not only for Mary, for us as well. One of the ways that you can mark your growth as a disciple is when you begin to realize that in your devotion and in your worship and in your prayer, you're quoting and using the language of Scripture as it so saturated your being. If you find yourself doing that, you find the Holy Spirit at work within you as you're growing deeper within the good news of Jesus. But the structure of Mary's praise also mirrors or parallels Hannah's song of praise to God from 1 Samuel chapter 2, the first 10 verses where Hannah praises God for blessing her with a son, Samuel, who would become one of the greatest judges of Israel. And so in your spare time, maybe this afternoon, I would encourage you to go look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and compare and contrast it to Luke 1. But regardless, Mary's celebrating. And in Mary's celebration, that's her message to us to prepare us for the birth of Jesus, the very baby that she's about to have in a few months. And as with most forms of celebration, not only is the object of celebration easily made evident in that outward expression of joy, but so is the reason for celebrating. You see, Mary clues us in early as to who God is the object of her celebration, but the very words of her praise just as well clue us into the reason for her celebration, Jesus. Tom Wright helpful, helpfully observes that Mary's praise is actually the gospel before the gospel. And that's a beautiful way to think about it and a good lens to kind of read and to understand the meaning of this text. He says it's a fierce, bright shout of triumph 30 weeks before Bethlehem, 30 years before Calvary and Easter. It's all about God and it's all about revolution and it's all because of Jesus. Jesus, who's only just been conceived, not yet born, but who has made Elizabeth's baby, John the Baptizer, leap for joy in her womb and has made Mary giddy with excitement and hope and triumph. And friends, he is absolutely right. It is all about Jesus and what Jesus is going to do in this world. And you see Mary's praise 
foreshadows what will ultimately come out of God sending Jesus because it is the gospel before the gospel, the good news before we see the good news unfold. And what this means is explicitly displayed in the last five verses, verses 50 and following. And it's at this pivot that Mary shifts from praising God for what he has done for her to praising God on what he's done beyond her for Israel, meaning what will ultimately be accomplished by Jesus and ultimately affect the rest of the world. And so if you still have your Bibles open, I want us to reread quickly the last five verses and then think through them. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humbling estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And so if we're going to distill the so what insight from these verses, we simply need to see how their book ended at verse 51 and 54 and 55. And then just quickly look at the contrast between 51 and 53. That sounds like a lot. That sounds super complicated, but it's super simple and quick. Remembering that helpful lens of the gospel for the gospel will keep it all in perspective. So the book ends at 50 and 54 and 55 have two common denominators, which sandwich the rest of the text. The first common denominator is the word mercy. You're going to see it recur in all three places. And then the second common denominator is the concept of lineage as denoted with like terms, generation and offspring. And so what we see is Jesus is the supreme act of God's mercy that is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, which we got way back in Genesis 12, 15, and 17 that promised in part that Abraham's offspring would be a blessing to the world as part of an eternal covenant. And so this good news to Israel is affirmation that what God promised Abraham, his covenantal promises to Abraham is now fulfilled in Jesus. Furthermore, God's mercy in our passage, as we see throughout all the verses, is about his steadfast and faithful action of love to those who revere and respect him as the sovereign Lord of all. So therefore, the bookends alert us to the fact that Jesus is fulfilling God's Old Testament covenantal promises to Israel, which also would carry positive consequences for the rest of the world beyond Israel to the Gentiles, to you and I. And these bookends also reveal that God's mercy shown in sending of Jesus is for those who display a reverent fear of him in Israel or outside of Israel, right? And so with those bookends setting the tone of the passage, we see a few contrasts between 51 and 53. You see in these three verses, God's power and might does a couple of things. It shows us that he humbles the proud, he dethrones the rulers, and he takes away from the rich. And so those who were humbled will be exalted. Those who were hungry will be fed and become full. Essentially, the consequential effects of the good news of Jesus Christ will be that the tyrannous and oppressive power structures of the world will be overcome and dismantled. Those in captivity will be freed, the starving will no longer be hungry, and the lowly and nobody will be elevated highly as somebody in the name of Jesus and God's kingdom. You see, the good and the good news of the gospel that is foreshadowed and celebrated here in Mary's song is that God will save the poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed. And in a beautiful form of continuity, these are the central themes of God's saving activity that is weaved throughout the entire ministry of Jesus that we see in the rest of Luke's gospel. And so with Jesus, we, Mary is saying and pointing to that the oppressed will be liberated. And moreover, the oppressors will be eradicated. The king of God's people and his kingdom will be a place of redemption, freedom, where the glory of God glories his people and all needs are met in, in abundance. With Jesus, all that is wrong with the world and abused in the wor world will be straightened out and put in right good order for the sake of those who revere and fear the Lord in the name of his Son. You see, the sending and coming of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is the full force of God coming in power and mercy in this world to right or rewrite the balance of power in the world from wickedness and injustice to holiness and righteousness for the blessing of those who simply believe 
and trust on him who has done it in Jesus. And so this second half of Mary's song of praise is about celebrating the faithfulness of God in keeping his promises to redeem his people and to bless the world through the coming of Jesus. You see, for Mary and Elizabeth, and even John the baptizer in Elizabeth's womb, Mary's conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit is proof and evidence by God that he is bringing to completion or fulfillment all that he has promised for thousands of years to his people Israel. And so it's during this Advent season that we as a church who believe on King Jesus and worship him because of the good news foreshadowed in Mary's praise come to fruition because we know the end of the story that the reason we worship and exalt and adore Jesus is because we know that what Mary said would happen indeed did happen or else we wouldn't be gathered here as the people redeemed and reconciled to God through Christ endowed with his spirit. You see, Christ's victory is for us who believe. It is given and bestowed to us by the Holy Spirit at work within our lives. And it's in this way that you and I have been liberated from the captors of sin and death and that we now have freedom, real supernatural ability, if you can believe it and trust on it, to overcome sin, to overcome the temptation of sin and the fear of death in this world by Christ's power that is at work within us who believe on him and trust him alone for salvation and not anything of ourselves. You see, each week in the likeness of Mary, when we worship, our corporate worship is our own individual song of praise and exaltation of God's great redemptive acts in Jesus that have been fully realized in our lives, those who have believed and trust on him. You see, the purpose of Advent is to help us rediscover our need for that salvation. Mary's hymn of praise was a reaction that bubbled out of a lifelong yearning and desire of God's rescue and salvific intervention in her life and in the life of Israel as a lowly people held in bondage and tyranny by those running the world. And with the conception of the Messiah, of Jesus, she was overwhelmed with the joy that God had finally took initiative and action and had come to save his people. And when you and I rediscover our own need to be liberated and rescued from the bondages of this world's power structures, of our own sinfulness, and from all that is wicked that prey on us. We're humbled in that moment, and we're reminded of our total dependency on God to be saved in any form and way, to be reconciled to him, and to be equipped to thrive in a world that is dark and cold. And that also draws us to Christ, either for the first time or in renewal to believe on his merits alone for salvation. Not our merits, not anyone else's merits, and that's the beautiful good and the good news of the gospel that was foreshadowed in this praise that has come to realization because of our own liberation, indicative of our own worship that we lift up each and every week. And so understanding or being reminded that we need the good news of the gospel is how the Advent season prepares us to genuinely celebrate Christmas which is coming next week, friends, as we have truly understood the significance of God's coming into this world in Jesus. And I want to just leave you with a quick thought before we close and transition to meet Jesus at his table. Is this exact time last year, I experienced one of the most enriching Advent Christmas seasons that I ever had because I was without the commercialization of Christmas and focused on the true reason for the season, Jesus. You see, during this time last year, I was thousands of miles away from home on a different continent, living out of two duffel bags, sleeping on a bunk bed with a mattress that was the size of this rug up here, crammed in a space with 50 other people. You see, our mission at, at this point last year was over. Our focus was now on packing up, out processing, leaving the Middle East, and jumping through all the re redeployment hoops to return back to our family. And you see, we would thankfully make it back during the middle of January, but that meant that we all missed Advent and Christmas and New Year. And as incredibly tough as it was not being with Sarah or my family, having been away from 10 months, uh, that time last year was one of the most enriching and edifying Advents and Christmases that I've ever experienced. You see, being isolated and removed from the secularization of Christmas and all the usual distractions and extras that make this season exhausting, each Sunday I was freed to focus on worship, 
not on Christmas gifts, not on Christmas parties, not on Christmas decorations. I didn't have to worry about holiday travel. Each week, I was able to anticipate Christ's coming and then come Christmas Day and Christmas Eve, celebrate his arrival in a fresh, wonderful, beautiful way and how both of those things continue to form me as a disciple. You see, last year I had the privilege of focusing purely on Advent and Christmas, embracing those two seasons as they're meant to be embraced. And as I endured that last chaotic and agonizing month of deployment that felt like 100 years, I experienced a profound sense of peacefulness and joy that I firmly believe resulted from the renewed peace and joy that I found in rediscovering my desperate need for Jesus as I took the seasons for what they were meant to be. And I realized I'd need Jesus not only to keep me for eternity, but to sustain me in the loneliness and worrisome of this present earthly. And as he did so faithfully in the waning days of that deployment when I had a weary mind and body and spirit, each Sunday in Advent and on Christmas, I was able to exalt God for never failing to meet my needs as I longed for and depended on him in the here and now, in the name of Jesus. Church and friends, as we enter this final week of Advent 2023, my hope and my prayer for you all is that you prayerfully and intentionally disassociate the secular commercialization of Christmas these last six or seven days with the true reason for the season, Jesus. Let this week be a week for you where you rediscover or discover anew your need for him so as to lift him up in your own genuine, joyful song of praise next Sunday on Christmas Eve and throughout the upcoming new year. And so with Christ on our mind, let's close and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we've seen, you've taken to yourself the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of your incarnate Son, our Lord Jesus. Father, grant that we who have been redeemed by his blood may share with her the glory of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.